Aussie Tech Heads is brought to you by startnewcompany.com.au. Register your company fast, easy, and direct with ASIC. All documentation is provided and held in your account for downloading at any time. If you're an accountant or other professional, you're also able to brand all documents with your company name. Coming soon, ABN, TFN, and Trusts. Special discount for ATH listeners. At the cart, use ATH20 for a $20 discount. And ATHwebhosting.com.au. Servers operate on SSD drives. Immediate activation, SSL certificates, Aussie support, domain registration, and easy install of WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. Hey, welcome to episode 672 of the Aussie Tech Heads, recorded on the 9th of April, 2020. I'm your host, Jason Oakley, and this is my co-host, Will Tompkinson. Hey, Will. Hey, man. How are you? Yeah, I've seen better days. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, the whole world's gone screwy. Yeah, you would, people would know I wasn't here last week. I don't think you were either, but we had a um, death in the close family, so I had to go down to Melbourne across the border during the COVID, which is a terrible time to do anything, and sit around in the hospital one and a half metres away from everybody else in the family because virus. Yeah, that's it. So, but yeah. I have been busy wasting my money on such things as... Commodore 64C. I love my, I miss my Commodore 64. With? Fast load. Epic's fast load reloaded. Mm, that wasn't and a thing that I had when I had mine. Little SD oh, card reader SD that's SD made to look like a Commodore 64 floppy drive. Okay, that's cool. Isn't that nice? I had a tape drive. <laughs> I had the 1541-2 drive, the sexy looking one that matched this. But that's a SD card. It's actually an adapter that's got the micro SD plugged into the SD adapter. Because I've got, I've got a little reader here for micro SD cards, and this drive takes SD, but my VZ takes micro SD. So that reader came with my Ender Three Creality uh, 3D printer. So yeah, I've got a real Commodore 64 playing games on it. That I can just put as he put all of the games ever made probably on an eight gig oh, probably, uh, SD card. Probably on a one gig, to be honest. Came with the yeah, one of El Cheapo. Is that the quick shot? Apart. Uh, what's it say? SVI Spectrum Video Quick Shot yep, One. Quick shot. I love the How quick did shot. You know? They were my favorite. Con- I know they had multiple controllers, but the quick shot was my favorite. Yep. And it had a. Um, was the hardest to break, I think. That's why I liked it. <laughs> I think I had a Cytec, really big one. But oh, one yeah. of my friends, one of my friends had a um, a joystick that had Mercury switches. Yep. So it didn't have a base. Yeah. It was, it was just, just the handle, and you hold that, and when you tilt it left and right, the switches would go. But the problem was the cable came out straight out the bottom of the base, and when you're trying to play a game, you put your hand down there to yeah. give yourself some leverage, and then snap the cable and so that was so. the biggest problem with the quick shot or well, the quick shot one the base wasn't too bad but it didn't have micro switches it had contact pads the little dome uh, pads right. and after yep. a while they'd get dirty and stop working you could pull it apart clean it wasn't then they bought out the quick shot two which was better because it had micro switches but the base was bigger so you couldn't hold it in your hand so it's like <laughs> uh... <laughs> and then there was a the quick shot pro i think it was which was literally just a full rotation joystick with a single button on it yeah so but uh pretty cool yeah now i had the the commodore 64 with the tape the tape drive i had a floppy drive but i never, didn't have any floppy disks to use on it <laughs> everything was oh, no. and i used to have like even a small game like um zork i had zork yep. on it and it yep. used to take like eight minutes or something to load just a text-based game I remember Michael Jackson uh, Moonwalker. The two games yep. I had that took forever to load: Michael Jackson Moonwalker and Seiko Yacht Racing Challenge. Ah, oh, I think I got the yacht race, the Australian Yacht Racing Challenge with my computer, and also international soccer. And um, Michael Jackson Moonwalker was such a badly designed game that after forty-five minutes of loading. You'd be put on the ma- you'd be put onto a screen where you'd start the game and you would die instantly because someone would kill you, like, <laughs> and then it was another forty five minutes to load the game again. Like it was horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's been. Uh, 
I had the action replay cartridge, I think version six, and with a floppy drive, it had a super turbo mode built into the cartridge. So you play, you load up a game, which took forever, and you hit freeze on the cartridge, yeah, and then put in another floppy disk, save, and it saved the memory state of the computer, yeah. And so, and then also in turbo loads, the next time you load it up, it's like chick 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 boom. There's yeah. a game. Well, that's similar thing on. I had a turbo tape, same yep. sort of thing, which I think it loaded pre-configured states. Um, the problem was to find because there was I don't know forty or fifty games on a tape because you're using yep. ninety-minute tapes. It relied on the tape counter, the ticker, to find exactly where the tape had to go. Oh, right. But over the years, of course, the belt stretches for the tape counter and it's not accurate anymore. So you could never actually um, 100% figure out where the tape was in reality. So if you didn't load exactly on the dead space between the games, it wouldn't, work, it. It wouldn't work properly. <laughs> so I had one of, one of these controllers, which I really loved. That was the Quick Shot. Quick, quick Shot 2. Quick Shot 2, two yeah. yeah. That they awesome, were a micro awesome. switch controller, but the base was bigger it than was. the Quickshot one. Yeah. Mm. But they had I was a really thinking nice that feel. was Cytec. No, it's a Quickshot. Yeah, it's yeah. Quickshot. Yeah. Like, no. No, it's a, they had a really nice feel to them. The turbo button back in the day, for those who don't know, these days the turbo button does entirely something different. Back then, yep. the turbo button literally paused and unpaused the game super fast. Or <laughs> depending on which button you could you could choose which button it would work on A or B. So it was like, A, it would like pause and unpause really, really quickly. It was more <laughs> like a slow motion sort of deal. Or it was literally just a rapid fire button. Like it just repeated the what, whatever your button press yeah, was. Yeah, I used it for rapid fire a lot. <laughs> so it used to freak out some games too because if you didn't turn it off between load scenes, it would continue <laughs> counting the control click. So the game would never <laughs> load because it couldn't process that. Yeah. So, But uh, those were the good old days back when games were games and fish were fish. I've still got a um, um, SD video output cable coming from the UK. Oh, yeah. So it should come up a lot nicer on the LCD TV. I've got a normal aerial cable, which is doing fine for now, but everyone's like, it's the S video one. Yeah. It should be a lot clearer image. You can also get an um, RGB output for them. Yep. Um, yep. Which... Well, this one comes with the, the um, composite. Yeah, and uh, S video cable as well. I'm just trying to find my capture card. I can't find it, but my capture card um, supports S video and RGB, and I've done a bit of playing with it. And the RGB is a nicer signal than the S video. So if you got, oh, all right. I, I, I think it was like, I think it was like RGB S video than composite. I think it was. In, yep. I think RGB was the most pure output. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Like 20, 30 years ago when the Commodore 64 was, no, it'd be more than that now when it was at its peak, oh, probably 30, 35 30, years ago. Years, something yeah. Like, yeah. If the consoles ha had then what we've since developed for them, they would have been, you know, like so that, that'd still be a commonplace console, you know, like the yeah. ease of use and the ability to use them has, has really um, brought them back into favour again, you know. I should so. give a free plug. The SD card reader and the cartridge came from a website in the UK called The Future Was 8-Bit. Ah, oh, I've heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone on, everyone on Twitter recommended them. Apparently, there's a guy in Australia who does do these, but... Um, Everyone's really good friends with the future was 8-bit. And um, I've also got TFW8.com or something like that. And TF, you guys yeah. are really good. I uh, just needed a... Um, there's a website has got SD card formatter. All right. Because um, the card that I had was originally in the Raspberry Pi. And so it was split into two petitions. Yeah. For that, for RetroPie. And so I deleted those and then formatted. Still wouldn't work on the Commodore 64 with this card reader. So then I used the SD card formatter, which they recommend, and then put it in there. And they've got an image that you unzip all of these files to it to tell it how to operate. And then when you want to load up, you put in the, your um, SD card, press uh, Commodore Run Stop, which does load star, comma 8, comma 1, automatically brings up the menu and then 
you can go in they've even pre-made folders for you so you can sort all your games it's got a b c d e f so you go to the c folder and then click on commando and it loads it up it's really good for those of you who are wondering the commodore 64 um very basic literally a keyboard couple of function keys the power supply was three quarters the size of the computer um, yeah, they call that the bread bin one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and inside, it's literally just a handful of of 8-bit chips. There's, um, yep. I think from memory, these couple over here are the sound chips. These ones are the video processing. This is the onboard, you know, like the top, sort of the, all these small ones in the center there, the actual usable, I guess it'd be RAM. Yep. Um, I think the... The Sid, the, Sid chip for sound and Vic2 chip for video. Yep. And then it's actual the actual uh, processing chips, you know that six five zero two, you know, well, sixty five ten in the later ones. Yeah, but I was actually um, no, that, that's a problem. Um, <laughs> I was reading a, an article where a guy's actually made all of these chips. He's actually flashed onto a modern. Oh, Peter, stop! I still like that game. He's actually <laughs> flashed onto a modern. Um, single chip. So like yep. all of this stuff here is taken and he's flashed it all onto one chip. So he's got the entire Commodore sixty four now <laughs> running on <laughs> on, on one chip. Sixty four on a chip. <laughs> um, and it's apparently more obviously more faster and more powerful than what the original one was anyway. Yeah. But anyway, that's a old fart geeks episode that we should have done. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> No, that, that was great. Yeah, I'm really happy to get a because I was after a Commodore 64 a couple of weeks ago, and I winced on the Australian Vintage Computer Group Facebook. Oh, they're all about four hundred dollars, and I can't get anything, and it's driving me crazy. And this guy's like, I've got a Commodore 64 computer that's in an Australian-made case from South Australia that's slimline, like the Commodore 64C, but it's actually got the original Commodore 64 in it, just so you could upgrade it and look nice. And so he put that on um, eBay and let people bid from like a dollar or something. And I was like, oh, that's all right. But it didn't come with the power supply or anything. So he said, I've also, I said, what about power supply? He said, no, I've got one of those to go with the Commodore 64C that's going to go up soon. And then he put the Commodore 64C on eBay with a buy it now price. And I did. <laughs> so apparently though i've been told by lots of people i have to replace the that brick big brick power supply because it will damage the commodore 64 eventually all of them apparently die and take out the commodore 64 from over voltage or something um so. yeah because well you could replace the capacitors in it and solve that problem it's just because the capacitors are getting old and they're leaking and they're just they're just allowing too much voltage through it it's a simple fix it's only half dozen capacitors in there that you can actually fix them and uh, ah. and do it. Or you can replace it with a smaller <laughs> power supply that's like a quarter of the size, you know. So Yeah, I just have to find a good supplier in Australia. It's got one that goes... Even j cars get one. You can get a J-Car and you can get a... Because it's only in a pin adapter in the back. It, I think I've right. seen those on eBay and the actual power supply you get from J-Cars. It's sort of nothing special. It's only oh. a 12-volt power supply, I think, from memory. Yep. Um... But yeah, back in the day, that was the way that they made them. Oh. So, but yeah, it's just yeah, that's it. It's literally a matter of replacing some capacitors and and uh, in worst case scenario, anyway, it's not a huge deal. It just takes out the it just takes out the um the smoothing circuit on the motherboard anyway, which is only it's not a big job to replace. Even worst case, it does damage it. Right. But apparently, the SID chip. These days, the SID chip is probably the biggest failure point in a Commodore 64 now. Because you can't get them. Um, you can get, well, you can get third-party ones. Um, yep. But it's just they're getting old now and the SID chips are just failing. Yeah, yeah. So it's just getting to that point. Oh, I have well, one of those. Well, shall we do some noose? Yeah, sorry, I just quickly saw this pop up. I'm like, I had one of these. I never, I didn't realise I had one of these until I just saw it. It's ah. a, it was a, where is it? There's literally a keyboard that went over the top of your keyboard. To my knowledge, that can take advantage. I remember seeing them, yeah. yeah. I completely forgot I even had one of those until I just saw that video. <laughs> Music machine. So, one chip. They didn't even, yeah, they didn't even use all of the, the processing power they could. 
The only cartridge game I had, I think, was uh, Ghostbusters. Oh, wow, I didn't know that was on mm. cartridge. But anyway, all righty. I um, suppose we should do some actual <laughs> stories. There goes half the audience. All uh, right. Uh, let's see. What have we got? Uh, Zoom, a competitor to Google's own Meet app, which they've now renamed Hangups. Hangups? <laughs> Google Hangouts. Well, I mean, you can. <laughs> it does do that, yes. Google Hangouts is now called Google Meet, so we should clarify that at the start. Yeah. Zoom, a competitor to Google's own Meet app, has seen an explosion of people using it to work and socialize from home and has become a cultural touchstone during the coronavirus pandemic. Last week, Google sent an email to employees whose work laptops had the Zoom app installed, cited its security vulnerabilities, and warned that video conferencing software on employee laptops would stop working starting this week. We've had a long policy of not allowing employees to use unapproved apps for work that are outside our corporate network, Jose Castaneda, a Google spokesperson, said. Recently, our security team informed employees using Zoom desktop client that it will no longer run on corporate computers as does not meet our security standards for apps used by our employees. Employees who've been using Zoom to stay in touch with family and friends can continue to do so through a web browser or via mobile. Earlier this month, Elon Musk's SpaceX also banned employees from Zoom, citing significant privacy and security concerns. And on Monday, New York City's Department of Education urged schools to abandon Zoom and switch to a service from Microsoft. So there's been a lot of yeah, because that's going to be much better. Stories about people being able to just drop in on your Zoom session if you haven't locked it down because you've got a lot of people from work who log in, then uh, anyone can just drop in on your meeting and see what your secret work meeting is about. But also, they put the Zoom meeting ID in the top, which gets leaked through screenshots, which is not Zoom's fault, but they've yeah. removed that now. Yeah, and also um, when you save your recording to the Zoom cloud, it has a guessable number for the uh, file name. So anyone can just run a program that guesses random file names or start at zero and go up to millions of numbers or whatever, and they will be able to download any of your videos because there's no security on it. Yeah. So Zoom is working on fixing that and have created a, a Zoom security task force now. Yeah. And I mean, the... <laughs> You know, it's the popularity of Zoom has gone nuts in the last week. Like every podcast I see is using it, every live meeting I see is using it. You know, um, because it's great, best thing out. It were, and even under all the stress of the networks under, it's performing perfectly fine. Yeah, um, they must have scaled like mad. Oh, I tell you what, it'd be nuts. My boss has this fascination with using Skype still. Yep. And um, the other day, just the two of us, just just nah. <laughs> <laughs> you know so but look, they fixed the some of the glare i mean it was never an issue for people who were set up the podcast correctly anyway because you never screen capture like that no you know it's not a thing that you do so you never see you know you never see this zoom id meaning because when you're screen capturing you're not capturing that anyway and, and the, other the, thing, the meeting it's gone yeah and the other thing that was a uh, yeah this is right one of the boris johnson um, one of the tweets they're doing, they put up a, a he put up a screen grab of all the participants he had in there, and he had a Zoom ID up the top, and they're wondering why they got a whole <laughs> heap of fake, a whole heap of people <laughs> turn up. Um, but the other thing that they've um, done now too that was a problem um, when somebody joined, because quite often you would email them the invite so they'd reply th through that to join. And when you, I wonder if I can emulate it. If I go and show here, you can see the bar pops up down the bottom. Yep. So then if I go into manage participants, it used to come up with not just their name, but it used to have their email address here as well. Or if they're on a phone, it comes up with their phone number. <laughs> That's no good. <laughs> so you'd go to join somebody, you host them or, or whatever you do, and you give Get out their the email details. address and their phone number. <laughs> Man. So, yeah, they, they've... You know, obviously, Zoom learned now. quick, didn't they? <laughs> well, they did, but I mean, they, they went from a realistically very in the in the scheme of video conferencing, they went from a very unknown company that really one, only certain people used for a certain process. Podcast, pretty much. That, that's 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 realistically it. The average person didn't use it. No. The average person used Facebook or Skype, Skype. 
or hangouts. FaceTime. Yeah, you know, normal people didn't use this. and But the last two weeks, it's just become the standard. Everybody just goes to Zoom. Um, I don't know what their rates are. And did they drop their rate? I know they're talking about dropping their rates um, for the period. Have they done that? Uh, pricing and plans. Let's see. Um, no, you can you can now do up to 100 participants on the free one. It's still a 40-minute time limit, but it used to only be like 10 participants. So they've dumped that up. Uh, or 15 bucks a month gives you the unlimited, yeah. What's the difference? Yep. Like a business plan. Okay. So they have a vendor URL and stuff in the business plans and whatever. But tell you what, the business plan, the, the, the standard ones aren't, yeah, it is on sale. It's down to 15 bucks a month. Um, but even the full, like, enterprise ready plan, um, is only 20 bucks a month. So that's. Uh. And it's got up to a thousand participants, five hundred uh, limited cloud stories. It does all the recording and stuff as well. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's definitely worth the money. Like, you know, for the sake of if you've got four or five people, we want to have a lag-free, high-quality, you know, uh, yeah. all that sort of stuff. It, it's definitely the best option still. I, Obviously, Google's not going to use it because they've got their own and, you know, I get the security concern thing, but you find me a program that doesn't have security flaws. Yeah. I mean, that's Windows. Part of, <laughs> that's part of the reason, like, we used, we used to use TalkShoe back in the day to let people um, basically call in on the podcast, you know, and it was the same thing. It was having the same issues where people could just brute force their way into it and um and same sort of thing so i mean once again they've probably fixed that by now because it's been a while since that was a thing but it's one of those things like if, if you're smart about what you're doing like the thing is even with the zoom one you still had to inv allow the people in like you had to manage them mm. you had to physically accept them so even if they did brute force their way in, they still can't appear on the screen unless you've got auto accept enabled, which you shouldn't. <laughs> no, it should be turned off by default. I guess it is turned off by default. Now. You, it is. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, it always has been. You have to manually... Ah, so they, people were doing it. Yeah, they were actually... Because if you're going to manage participants, you can, you can set... Um, uh, where are we? Yeah, put put attendees into waiting room on entry, so you turn that off and then go straight into the into the thing. So, but by default it's turned on. So I don't know. But anyway, it's good oh, yeah. for Zoom because I think at the end of the day they've um, definitely coming out on top of this. So yeah. good on them. Yeah, it's we support them like mad. Oh yeah, that's it. Speaking of Google. Um, because, you know, why not? <laughs> <laughs> the Google Stadia, the gaming platform, they've decided to introduce bandwidth controls, um, ah. basically to manage the traffic demands. So, they, um, <clears throat> you know, obviously they've increased their back end to try and handle it and stuff, but with so many people trying to use the service they just can't cope so what they've done is, is things like they've dropped the quality from 4k down to 1080p um and realistically if you're playing on a normal desktop monitor or on a laptop something like that you're not going to notice a difference anyway yeah. you know it's it's going to be so minimal um but they've yeah they've just doing a few little tweaks just to reduce their their massive server load because obviously it's gone from then it was another one of those services as a matter of bad timing they kind of launched it just before this all took off so they didn't ever really get that much of a chance to test it before it became you know like <laughs> insanely over overwhelming so i guess they've they've had to adapt and overcome um yep. but sticking with google uh cloudflare 
dumps capture as Google intends to charge for its use or recapture, I should what? say. Uh, internet web infrastructure company Cloud. Cl- none of those were words. Internet <laughs> web infrastructure company Cloudflare announced plans to drop support for Google's recapture service and move a new bot detection provider named HCAPTURE. Cloudflare co-founder and CEO Matthew Prince said the move was motivated by Google's future plans to charge for the use of recapture service, which would have added millions of dollars in annual costs for his company, costs that Cloudflare would have had to pass on. That's entirely within their right, he said. Cloudflare, given their volume, no doubt imposed significant costs on a recapture service, even for Google. With the value of the image classification training did not exceed those costs, it makes perfect sense for Google to ask for payment. Um, but going forward, Prince said Cloudflare, Cloudflare would begin integrating a new anti-bot capture system into Cloudflare products named H Capture, provided by California-based company Intuition Machines Incorporated. Intuition Machines usually makes money by renting access to H Capture to companies who want to run image classification experiments and then pay website owners to implement H Capture product. But Cloudflare says they'll be paying the California company instead, rather than get paid by H Capture. Prince said it ensures that. Intuition machines will have resources to scale this infrastructure to meet the demands. Um, so Cloudflare is a managed DNS provider for 11.5% of all internet traffic websites, apparently, and a reverse proxy firewall for 12.5% of internet sites, handling gigantic amounts of traffic on a daily basis. Prince says that while paying, paying for the ability to use hash capture does get, generate some additional costs, the Cloudflare CEOs, though, are a fraction of what recapture would have cost. Uh, and apparently, Hash Capture is more private as well. So, yeah. which I mean, given that it's not owned by Google, is most likely true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know. So, um, that's interesting. They do it to themselves. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, someone's got it, I suppose. Attackers can bypass fingerprint authentication with an eighty percent success rate. For decades, decades, the use of fingerprints to authenticate users to computers, networks, and restricted areas was, with a few notable exceptions, mostly limited to large and well-resourced organizations that use specialized and expensive equipment. That all changed in 2013 when Apple introduced Touch ID. Within a few years, fingerprint-based validation became available to the masses as computers, phones, and lock manufacturers added sensors that gave users an alternative to passwords when unlocking their devices. Although hackers managed to defeat Touch ID with fake fingerprints less than 48 hours after the technology was rolled out in the iPhone 5S, fingerprint-based authentication over the past few years has become much harder to defeat. Today, fingerprints are widely accepted as a safe alternative over passwords when unlocking devices in many, but not all, contexts. study published on Wednesday by Cisco's Talos Security Group makes clear the alternative isn't suitable for everyone, namely those who may be targeted by nation-sponsored hackers or other skilled, well-financed and determined attack groups. The research has spent about $2,000 over, $2, over several months testing fingerprint authentication offered by Apple, Microsoft, Samsung, Huawei, and three lock makers. The results, on average, fake fingerprints were able to bypass sentences on at least once on roughly 80% of the time. The percentages are based on 20 attempts for each device with the best fake fingerprint the researchers were able to create. While Apple products limit users to five attempts before asking for a PIN or password, researchers subjected the devices to 20 attempts, that is multiple groups from one or more attempts. Of the 20 attempts, 17 were successful. Other products tested permitted significantly more or even an unlimited number of unsuccessful tries. Tuesday's report was quick to point out the results required several months of painstaking work with more than 50 fingerprint molds created before getting one to work. The study also noted that demands of the attack, which involved obtaining a clean image of a target's fingerprint and then getting physical access to the target's device, meant that only the most determined and capable adversaries would succeed. Even so, this level of success rate means that we have very high probability of unlocking any of the tested devices before it falls back into pin unlocking. The researchers wrote, the results show fingerprints are good enough to protect the average person's privacy if they lose their phone. However, a person that is likely to be targeted by a well-funded motivated actor should not use fingerprint authentication. The devices that were most successful, susceptible to fake fingerprints were the AI case padlock and Huawei's Honor 7X and Samsung's Note, 7, no, uh, Note 9 Android phones, all of which were bypassed 100% of the time. 
fingerprint authentication on the iPhone 8, MacBook Pro 2018, and the Samsung S10 came next, where the success rate was more than 90%. Five laptop models running Windows 10 and two USB drives, the Verbatim Fingerprint Secure and Alexa Jump Drive F35 perform the best with researchers achieving a 0% success rate. Hmm. So the average person doesn't mean anything, but if you work for the government or some important security place, could be a problem. But I mean, you got to remember too that... I mean... Up, and I don't know if it's still a thing, but up until very, very recently, you could defeat a fingerprint scanner with a photocopied um, fingerprint. Yeah. <laughs> photo -photo fingerprint. So, you know, like a. Same for face unlocking, just get a photo. I stopped using face unlocking on my phone because it seemed to be too easy. Yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah. <sighs> Fingerprint's fine for Probably, me. I use it. I'm not going to type in my pin or draw a little pattern every time. I do the pattern thing just because my phone is usually so filthy that, like, it. <laughs> it's you clean it up for you logging in. Yeah, pretty much. Usually the fingerprint here doesn't work because it's so dirty that it's it's just it's just all gummed up anyway. So I just use the little pattern thing. But the you know they have the retina recognition thing and like it's just you know where do you where do you stop? <laughs> yeah. You Just know. remember, most likely the government and other people don't care what you've got unless you're incredibly important. Self-importance does not count. Yeah, no. That's exactly. Um, My mum's said I'm really important. It's not somebody does, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's it. Um, what you got for us? So I'm just trying to find the second half of the story because I, I forgot to find it before, but... <laughs> Um, Can I go on with another one while you're looking? So the thing is with this coronavirus, okay, I'm trying to avoid talking about it too much. Um, but basically, oh, seriously, did I just close that window? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I hate it when ah. that happens. Um, We're professionals, damn it. <laughs> professional something. I haven't figured out what yet, though. Um, to but the profession. it has had some upsides to to this in terms of it's brought makers together, um, and it's brought uh, people who would traditionally work separately and apart, and, and really never, um, you know, never really been interacting with each other. It's it's brought all these people together to develop solutions to problems that we didn't even know we had. So in a lot of the cases at the moment, things like face masks, respirators, all this sort of stuff is becoming an issue. Um, of supply and demand. There's just there's physically too many people are just needing the products, and we d we don't have availability to to do them. Um, now, if you guys, anybody who's watched for a while knows, I'm not a fan of uh, Linus Tech Tips generally. Um, but his last video he put out, they got um they got 30 printers from Perusa and they assembled them and made a giant factory. And what they're doing is they're printing um, printing face shields. So they're printing the upper portions, the lower and the lower bits, and then the center parts just laser cut acrylic. And they're going to... Um, I was trying to remember where they were going to... But there's a company that's handling all these, and after they print them, they then take them to this company or ship them to this company who's disinfecting them and then sending them out. Um, you know, and they're doing, you know, they're making 300 face shields a day. Um, and it was all started by makers coming together and figuring out what they could do and what they could make. Um, then Perusic donated all these printers and then they had to actually, um, they had to actually find people to assemble them. So they all the makers, maker spaces in the area, they dropped all these printers off and got them all assembled and, and stuff like that. So it was pretty cool that they're doing that sort of thing. Um, go to, um, opshieldsup.org. Yeah, well, there's a few, there's another one called, um, 
That's where they're uh, sending I... the um, uh, stuff from Linus. I know that, yeah, they're, they're sending to a few different places. There's another place, uh, Amber, Amber Mac, if you don't remember Amber Mac from the good old, um, oh, what was that show? Amber Mac and they had... Leo. Yeah, it was actually a TV show they had for a while. I can't, I've got a complete blank now. But uh, she interviewed one of the guys from um, uh, Canadian Shield, who's another company who's who's managing the um, the distribution and all that sort of stuff. And um, there, yeah. But if you go to the cool part is you go to Thingiverse. All these things are available. You go to Thingiverse and you can print everything from the face, the face masks, the shield brims. Call for help. Call for help. That's it. Yeah. Um, you know, and people have got all these different designs. They're full respirators. There's you know surgical mask straps. There's um. Yeah, you know, all just amazing, like mass designs and all this different stuff that the people are making to to help the cause, you know. Um, and there's several different versions. Like there's there's um, some of the face shields for normal people. There's face shields for people who wear glasses. There's like this one here, I think, from memory, um, is a shield for using. I think it's this one. Is the one Isn't that, that what Geordie wears in Star Trek? <laughs> I think this one from memory is the <laughs> one that uses, you know, the folder like your um, binders, the yep. the paper, the inserts out of the binders where it's got the holes in the top. That yep. one's actually designed to fit the holes of the binder around it, so you can oh, just right. use one of those. So, so yeah. So as much as you know, I sort of avoid talking about it. It, it really has done some pretty cool stuff in terms of the maker spaces and and the 3D printers and, and given people something. To, I mean, so many people are at home and so many people have a 3D printer. I mean, I've got one over my shoulder there, you know, that that I use. Well, I haven't, but I have started using recently. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people are at home now, nothing else to do. So, yeah, they might as well, you know, use their time constructively and, and 3D print something like that. Um, even if it's, you know, either in a lot of situations you're printing enough of them that you can donate them. Um, but even if you just wanted to print, you know, enough for yourself to use or whatever, you know, it, it's just, a, just the ability now that you have the option to do that. Uh, as Help an out the neighbours. You know, as an example, I printed this, this is a, a um, Ryobi battery insert and this is a receiver for a Black & Decker battery. So these will get glued, glued and screwed. I run a couple of cables down the center of it, and then I can run my Black & Decker batteries in my Ryobi, so I haven't got to buy more batteries. So I've got a heap, just the wrong type, so make them fit. Nice. You know, so they, they're, they're starting to come into their own now, and the ability to buy a relatively cheap 3D printer for 150 bucks and have it like 95% work straight out of the box um, yeah. is pretty cool. Pretty amazing. It, it really is. Um, and just on that, another story that uh, Amber covered, uh, which I I had sort of known about and I forgot about, a uh, university. Um, man, let me bring the thingy, the thingy with the thingy. Robots replace <laughs> university students in Zoom graduation ceremony. So speaking of Zoom, this is what reminded me of it. Um, telepresence robots stand in for university students at a graduation due to concerns over the coronavirus in Japan. So they they had um, basically the if you look at the, they basically had iPads on the front of these robots and the people who were in the Zoom meeting but they also had control over their own robot so they could actually um, they could actually control the robot where they tell the robot where they wanted to go and all that sort of stuff but they could actually go up and get their get their diplomas and everything handed to them from the you know for the graduation ceremony and. <laughs> stuff like that nice. so so that was pretty cool they use zoom for the face face part of it and stuff like that so yeah so I thought that was just a good little once again you know technology bridging the gap you know of of uh social interaction there yeah so uh so what else That's you pretty got cool there? Google is now backing a standard proposed by Apple engineers in January to create a default format for one-time passcodes sent by SMS 
to users during the two-factor authentication process. The standard proposed by Apple engineers working on the Safari WebKit project has now reached the status of official web platform incubation community group specification draft. We've moved to origin bound one-time codes delivered via SMS, where we're working on a shared spec with our collaborators at Google. Please take a look. The proposal aims to fix some issues with the current state of SMS two-factor OTP codes, all of which have different formats unique per the website sending the codes. In January, Apple engineers came up with the idea to structure these messages and have the same identical format for all SMS 2FA operations going forward. The primary contribution that the new standard makes is to mandate that all SMS OTP messages contain the URL of the website that has the code. According to the new proposal, the new SMS format for OTP codes would look like this. 747723 is your website authentication code at website.com and then hash with the same thing again. The first line is intended for human users, allowing them to determine from what website the one-time password came from. Second line is for mobile apps and browsers, which will be able to extract the one-time password code and finish the 2FA operation. If there's a mismatch and the autocomplete operation fails, then the user will be prompted to review the SMS and enter the code by hand. Experts believe that mismatching errors will most likely take place during attacks with modern phishing kits that can bypass 2FA codes. This proposal attempts to reduce some of the risk associated with SMS delivery of one-time codes, Apple and Google engineers wrote in a revised explainer. There's not attempt to reduce or solve all of them. For instance, it doesn't solve the SMS delivery hijacking risk, but it does attempt to reduce the phishing risk. However, despite the palpable security benefits for the time being, Mozilla has not in expressed any public interest towards supporting the new standard. Sand proposals have gotten stuck at the WICG before. However, Apple's proposal has received overwhelmingly positive reviews since it was put forward in January. Mm. Fair enough. Oh, no, don't stupid. it. I know that <laughs> I'm using I know it's using cookies. Like just the funny thing is about that. They say we need to inform you that our website's using cookies. Do you agree? Like every other website. But you don't have the option to not <laughs> well, I guess you do have the option to not agree. You can close the website. <laughs> but it's not like if you say no, I don't agree. The website would still function. It would work perfectly fine. They just can't track where you came from. So it's either <laughs> you agree to it or you don't use the internet. Well, they're, they're your two options. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like saying... It's really handy for stuff like if you go to Facebook or Google, you don't have to type in username and password every time because it's the info stored in the cookie. Oh, yeah, I know. But like, it, it's, they make it sound like you've got a choice. Like, this website uses cookie. Do you want to proceed? It's like... Well, yeah, you can click yes or yes, because the only other option is to close the you website. Can, you it's, can press yes or screw off somewhere. Yeah, it's it's like saying you know we know tax is voluntary. You don't have to pay it, but see what happens if you don't. You know, it, it's the same sort of thing. <laughs> go to jail. You know, but um, the new pic I'm actually quite interested in these. These are the new Pixel Buds by Android. Actually, the uh, Pixel Bud oh. Two, I guess technically. <laughs> Um, and, and I got these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a report on showing on the new True Wireless Google Pixel Buds showing up for pre-order uh, on their website. People are actually able to place pre-orders and emails have been sent out suggesting that the release could be as soon as the end of April. ABT are now sending emails uh, with shipping information to those who pre-order the earbuds. Um so everyone expected the Pixel Buds to arrive at the same time as the 4A, which is around the uh, original Google I.O. date, second week of May. But now since they're bringing right. it forward, um, Australia's been included in the same timeline as the U.S. It's likely... See, here's the problem, though. The pricing in the U.S. is 179 which three months ago would have made them about 210 220 bucks. Um, yep. that now 179 so they're going to be at least $300 now, if not more. Yep. Um, unfortunately, since the Australian dollar is just absolutely tanked. But um, I would quite like those. They, they 
look really nice. They don't go in your ear like the iPod ones. They sit on the outside of your ear, which I'm more of a fan of. I mean, they don't sit like like these, like on the outside, but they they sort of sit flush. You know, they're not um, super intrusive, yeah. and they don't look like they're super painful. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but I I quite like that. I know they had. There was uh, another one they had called Ear Beans. Um, so there's the, the Galaxy Buds, which are basically what these ones are, the Pixel Buds. Um, but these are the... Um, yeah, for better word, they're calling them Ear Beans. The shape is a radical departure from the traditional style of earbud and will apparently come without any silicon tips to assist the stay in place. Um... The design features dual speakers per ear, microphones for calls, and audio pass through, and a sensor to detect if the bean is removed from the user's ear. And with yeah. the correct weighting, the bean may be secure for non active usage, but the experience will find the fully wireless earbuds do not incorporate some sort of locking mechanism to secure it to your ear. They're prone to calling out, I think that's supposed to be falling out, and, sta- and standard <laughs> use almost unusable. Unusable. You don't want to go jogging with them. Yeah, that's a really long way. Of, that entire paragraph could have been summed up in six words. Don't jog. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, so I mean, they they're all right, but they're not really uh, what I'm after. I I much prefer the look of these. So, um, as yep. Justin in the chat room said, he's got um the Samsung buds. I'm guessing he's got the first version of those, and he said the batteries last at least six hours. You know, which yep. realistically, if technically, they only, if they last eight hours, that's going to do most people. Most people, you know, that's eight hours of continuous use, you know, which means yep. really that's 10 to 12 hours of wear time. You know, if you put them in when you leave home and you're gone for 12 hours, you take them out when you get home again, you know, so you might use them for six or eight continuous hours in that period of time. Um I remember when I had my Nokia N95. Um, yep. It had... I bought a Bluetooth... Ear, um, it looked like a little iPad Nano dealio thing. Um, but it uh, was a Bluetooth adapter to put normal earphones in and so it's pretty big it was the size of a matchbox and so basically it would bluetooth communicate with the phone and then you could put a normal set of earphones in it so you didn't have to wear the back then the really crappy nokia earbuds that came with the thing you could wear a decent (laughs) set of earphones um and that was like since i i discovered later on it was like 95 percent battery in there because it eventually died and i pulled it apart and had a look and it was pretty much all battery and it only lasted yep. three hours. So, oh, right. I don't know. Like, they've obviously really reduced the... Um, they've really reduced the the current draw of Bluetooth, obviously, because to get batteries in that earpiece that lasts six or eight hours use, that's... Pretty bloody good. <laughs> you know, that's pretty impressive, really. And battery yeah. technology hasn't changed in 10 years, so it's not... It's not that part of it that's that's changed. It's obviously the power consumption part of it that they've improved. Yeah, Bluetooth light and all that. I got these today, uh, Jabra Elite 25E. They go around the back. Most of that is battery in there, so it goes for 18 hours. Oh, that's good. And um, it's got a button on the side here. For you, Jugles or Alexa or whoever you want to program it to, even that Siri thing, whatever that is. And then um, this that's got the microphone on that side as well. And then this side's got the usual volume up, down, on, off. And uh, pressing the center button will go to the next song or redial the last person you talk to and stuff like that. And um, if you get the two earpieces and touch them together, they're magnetic and will hold together. So it'll hang up a call or um, stop the music playing just by touching the two heads together and letting them magnetically lock. Oh, okay. Which I think is pretty cool. That's not bad. Yeah. It's an easy way of doing it, I suppose. Yeah. Well, the only thing, I went, I went to four places today. I wanted to find over-the-ear 
headset like this because I like over the ear. Yeah. I don't like it pushing on my ears because yeah. when we used to do Minecraft for eight hours a day, your ears get really squished and sore. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to get a cable because these were having a problem with the Bluetooth. But they, unless you got the um, the 3.5 mil um, plug-in. Which is what I use. To, I wanted to get the USB. But uh, USB headsets are like $400 or $300. So um, I ended up going to that horrible HN place that I don't like to give money to that person. But these were on special 95 bucks down from 128 So I was like, I can use it with, I'm using it now with my desktop computer and the built-in audio. I can sync it to my phone and use that and everything works really well. So Yeah. See, I've got these ones. These are Sennheiser. These are the third pair of these yeah. I've got. Sign, yep. Sennheiser, Sign, Sennheiser, whatever you say. Um, these are slightly different to the last pair. They're not quite as over the ear. These are almost, they, they do just go over the ear, but I'd call them almost an Oni. Um, yeah. But they got really like that padding is like it's 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 like over an inch, super you know, thick, <laughs> inch and a half thick up the top there. So it's super soft. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it's they were the cheapest ones I could find, and they were hundred and fifteen or something. Apparently, you just uh, can't get corded headphones anymore. So <laughs> you know. Because the last pair... That's I, with, I, thank you, Apple. Yeah. I've got two older pairs sitting over there that I used before I bought these ones. So just the the material, the vinyl has worn off the the earpiece. Yep. So there's just... The, they flake, like leave black garbage everywhere. Yeah, it's um, terrible when they get to that stage. Yeah. I had a chair that did that. Um, but they were only 65 bucks or something. And yep. I think they're actually a nicer sound than they. These aren't too bad, but I'm pretty sure the other one sounded nicer. Though. I'm, uh, at least I remember them sounding nicer. Um, and yeah, these are like <laughs> twice the price. And I, I they're smaller. They're everything about them, the band's thinner, the earpieces are smaller, the the cable short. The cable on this thing's only oh, three foot at a push. The other ones were like yep. twenty foot long. You know, so I uh, they're paying twice as much, and you're getting almost half the product. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, the sure. turtle beach that I had, you could put the headphones on and walk up the other end of the house, and the cable would still be reaching. It was yeah. that ridiculous. Know, that's it's like this like. road, this road microphone I've got. Yeah, is um, <laughs> I could take that up the other end of the house with this much cable. Well, that's that's why, crazy. like, I've got an XLR mic. I'm using a Shaw mic, and I've got like a little yep. one meter cable on it now. But um, I think it came with a twenty meter cable. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I could be out the Yeah, you can't yard. complain. I mean, you're not going to run out. And that's no. the worst thing that can happen. Having too much, fine, who cares? But you run out because you only get one meter. That's yeah. a real bitch. Well, it's not too bad now that my mixer's sitting beside me. But in the old setup where the mixer was over there, like I was literally right on. I had one, one meter or 20 meters. I didn't have anything in between. <laughs> it was sort of like, I really should do something about that. <laughs> so, uh. but. Um, I don't know if I showed you. I reprinted. I showed you one of those a while ago that I printed this headphone holder. Like this mounts on your. Table. Oh, yep, and it snapped you off. You can hang your headphones here, wrap your cord up, and plug the thing into there. Well, I reprinted yep. it with a different spool of PLA, and uh, this one's behaved itself. So obviously, the other one just didn't quite, just didn't quite oh, uh, nice. stick together. Yeah, it snapped. It snapped clean off down down here. But so this is really handy because. It's, it just sits on the table and then when I take my headphones off, instead of putting them on the desk and then them being in the way no matter where I put them, I can just sit them there and yeah. they're good. <laughs> they're out of the way. I know where they are. I was hanging them over my monitor. Yep. But then when you want to use the monitor and not the... It's like, what do I do with well, them? Well, I was putting them over the microphone stand, which was fine. But then I'd put my microphone stand up over there out of the way and then I'm like, <laughs> where are my headphones? <laughs> so... Yes. Uh, um, just quickly, we're probably getting a bit that way, but I just saw this story earlier. I thought this is amazing. I kind of want one just for nostalgic reasons. The new foldable Moto Razor is finally available through Telstra. Uh, it's the... So uh, is the Galaxy Flip Z. Yeah. It's clamshell foldable display. Outright purchase is... Uh, 
$2,699. No, thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, okay, you know. $112 a month from the 36, <laughs> or 24 months. Yeah, or 74, 75 on the 36, 36. months. It's an addition that on top of the plan cost, which start at $50 per month for 15 gig. Um, it's worth noting that Samsung's second foray into foldables has launched too. The Galaxy Z Flip is also available from Telstra at $2,199 or 95 a month <laughs> or on a 24-month plan. Um, Motorola doesn't quite come off as confident about its high price foldable since they aren't see- sending out review units to anybody. Yeah, uh, everyone said, would you buy a phone that nobody gets to review? I don't think so. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, overseas reviews have been middling at best. Wired says the Razer is a cheap phone in a foldable body. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, with the old processor, apparently it's got an old processor and a substandard camera. Well, the Verge headline put it succinctly folding flip phone flops. <laughs> the Razer <laughs> spec sheet and price tag might not make sense value wise, but it's not a phone you'd buy for specs alone. It's more of an emotional purchase. No, an emotional purchase would be at like, I $300, like the, $300. the form factor of the, the Galaxy Fold. I thought that was a nice form factor, but probably very thick, heavy phone. Yeah, I... No, I mean... They did a hands-on review. This is back in November, but um, I, I can't... I mean, I, I know it's a foldable screen. I get it's new technology and you're paying more for the privilege of having a foldable screen. But it's such a slow... It's only a 16 meg, and it's probably not even a true 16 meg camera. It's a Snapdragon 710. Um, yep. It's... It, there's nothing really special about it. Do they even have the memory specs and stuff? And micro, Microsoft had just announced that their dual screen, which was a good compromise, is going to be pushed back several months due to the COVID thing too, so... Yeah. Um... It's let's see, price yeah, price is twenty two hundred. But see, the price will probably go up too now that the Aussie dollars tank so much. Um, yep. I'm just trying to see if they talk about memory or anything. Like that. They don't really talk about that here. But it's look honestly, if you're going to <sighs> that the phone that they're trying to emulate was always just a geek phone like it was a flip phone it was fun to have but it, even the original razor was a cheap phone it wasn't yep. an expensive phone you can't get people to purchase like it's not going to be a an, um, an emotional purchase because the original phone wasn't expensive it was only a cheap phone. It's yeah. like it's it's like releasing the fifty one ten. You know, to re release the fifty one ten successfully, it has to have a seven year battery life and you have to be able to drop it off a three hundred story building and the phone be perfectly fine. And it has to be twelve dollars. Yeah, right. I mean, then you'll get the emotional purchases. You know, like it <laughs> it can't be a completely different phone to the original phone you're trying to emulate and expect people to pay an exorbitant amount of money for something that is not even an up to par like if you know if it's a particular chinese company who i have an affinity for was to make a phone very similar to that it would be a two or three hundred dollar phone you know yeah because it, it, it that's what it, that's technically realistically all it's worth you know um who i might add i've actually done a 5110 which is pretty cool but um <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I it'll be interesting to see. I, I really can't imagine anybody forking out, you know, best part of three grand for it. that. It, it's uh, even as much as I'm not an iPhone fan. Even the top of the range iPhone is not even that much, is it? Isn't it only like twenty five hundred no, or something? Something like that. And let's yeah. face it, even that <laughs> you're going to get a much heavier duty hardware spec. You know, like as 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 play as much playing catch up as the iPhones do, they're still ahead of that. You know, like the yeah. What 
I mean, uh, was, is it even Motorola? Like, <coughs> really, uh, Motorola used to be on the cutting edge. Like, they were the they were the first m- first mobile phone. They they had the analog technology to do it. They they set up the system. They designed it. Like, in, I think it was like seventy eight or seventy nine. They had the first analog car phone. You know, and then they did the handphones in like eighty four three or something was the first the first analog person to person communication, you know, like mobile communication. Now if it was a microtech Yeah, well. You remember the microtechs? <laughs> they were flip phones. Yeah. Yeah, they were. I had a I don't know what I had, I can't remember what I had. Some big chunky thing. It was a it was a pen touch notepad that you could t- also uses a phone <laughs> the phone was, i swear the phone was an afterthought it had a calendar it had notepad it had all this other stuff and it just happened to make phone calls as well <laughs> <laughs> and i've never been able to find it on the net anywhere like i know harvey norman sold it at one point but i yep. i have never been able to find i don't know what it was you know but um i don't know it's it's just it's just, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I just can't see people buying that. It's just, that's all there is to it. Yeah, I just, think so. No. You know, <laughs> there, there's a point and even, even, even the, the people who are going to buy it for the, the classic appeal, just, they're going to just not, no. you know. The Xbox co-creator Rob Wyatt has filed a lawsuit against Atari for failing to pay him for the design work he did in creating the new Atari VCS console. Oh, no. Tin Giant, Wyatt's company, filed the lawsuit in Federal Court of Colorado, alleging a breach of contract and defamation. Tin Giant said that Atari owes it in excess of $261,720. Wyatt, a co-creator of the Xbox and co-founder of The Last Game Board, said in an interview last year that he quit as lead architect for Atari. He alleged that Atari did not pay his company Tin Giant for six months of work. Atari CEO Fred Chastney declined to comment in the statement, saying that he had not received a copy of the lawsuit yet. Atari has not developed a game console for more than 20 years, but the original plan for VCS was called First Atari Box. It was hatched by Fergal Mac Colland in 2017. But Atari pressed the pause button on the Atari box project and postponed pre-orders and Matt left. During the Game Developers Conference in March 2018, Atari said it had revived the project and renamed the machine to Atari VCS. Janae said the machine was going to ship in 2019, but Atari missed those dates and then promised to ship this spring. Wyatt's lawsuit said that Tin Joint agreed to a contract in June 26, 2018. Wyatt said that he had performed his obligations under the deal and submitted invoices totaling $261,720. By October 2019, White demanded payment, but said he received nothing. He said Atari falsely claimed that Tin Joint had delayed the console project and had failed to complete its scope of services under the agreement. In fact, it was Atari's own mismanagement of the console project that was the cause of or reason for the delay to launch, the lawsuit said. It also said that uh, they'd made false statements to the public about, about Tin Giant. Atari has yet to ship the VCS to customers who pre-ordered it or to otherwise start shipping. The company recently said the coronavirus had disrupted its plans. And also possibly the Atari online crypto casino they've launched now that nobody cares about. That's like the uh, the Hotels GTA, too. Like the GTA 5 online casino that nobody talks about. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just do a quick one to finish up. In the Unstone PlayStation blog, we'll need Mr. T to load up a screenshot of this one. The DualSense PlayStation controller will keep much of what gamers love about the DualShock 4 intact, while also adding new functionality and redefining, refining the design. Touch was a big inspiration when designing the DualSense, and haptic feedback is one of the ways this new controller will help bring PS5 games to life. Sony mentions that this feedback will add a variety of powerful sensations you'll feel when you play, such as the slow grittiness of driving a car through mud. Adaptive triggers has been incorporated into the L2 and R2 buttons, which will help players heal the tension of your actions, like when drawing a bow to shoot an arrow. The angle of the hand triggers were changed and some subtle updates were made to the grip. One thing that will be missing from the DualSense is the share button that was featured on the DualShock 4. 
showing from the controller is not gone, but the previous button is now called Create. Yay. Sony promises more details will be revealed on this change we get close to PlayStation 5's date launch date. DualSense will also have built-in microphone array that would allow players to easily chat with friends, even for those who don't own a headset. As for the controller's color, it's a bit of a non-traditional design as far as PlayStation is concerned. Usually PlayStation controllers have a single color, but the DualSense has a two-tone design to make it stand apart. Additionally, the position of the light bar, which will be returning, was moved to give it an extra pop. Now the light bar sits on either side of the touchpad as opposed to the top of the controller. That looked like the Stormtrooper version. What do you reckon? Hmm. I'm just <laughs> more intrigued about their... Um... Okay, I understand how you can apply force to shoulder buttons and stuff to make it feel like you're actually pushing on something. But I don't get how they reckon you can actually feel the sensation of like when you're driving. That, that doesn't uh, that's not how <laughs> haptic feedback works. <laughs> no. You need to be wearing a suit for that sort of thing. Like, But you're driving in mud. It said mud. I know. That's what I mean. So the con a controller in your hand, like, it it's going to be in your hand. It doesn't matter how you're holding that controller. It doesn't have resistance. The c it they make it harder to turn. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> That's not how any of this works. No, f physics, physics doesn't work like that. You can't just bend the space time around the controller. It's. I get that you can make the buttons do certain. This is PlayStation. Yeah, I know, right? They could do anything. Mm. I understand how you can make the buttons have a certain feel and resistance, and yeah, okay, I get that. But yeah, no. no. <laughs> I mean, I'll when it comes out, I'll go down to my local. Do I even have a local? EB Games. No, I think I've got is it a GameStop or something? Oh. Um, it's not EB Games. It's something else. But anyway, I don't even know if they're still there. But I'll go down to them and I'll try it out and see what it's like. But I mean, I'll be I'll be curious to know if it's. Everything they say. How do they do it? I'd like to know what's under that. They seem to have missed an opportunity here. Like under this flap here, they could have had a screen or something. That used to be a touch screen on the other one. Well, it's not on this one. Doesn't look like it. I mean, it looks like it should be. Like it looks like it should pop out, but there's nothing in that rendering. Hmm. I don't know on that one. But it looks like them. I don't know. Who knows? Who <laughs> knows what they're doing? That's it for you. Um, just quickly, I was just going to say the new um, the new Xiaomi uh, M the mine me man and nah, nah, nah. English is hard. <laughs> the Xiaomi, um, I don't think is an English word. <laughs> See, that's why English is hard. So basically, the new Xiaomi Mi Nine, which is uh, their latest release, um, it's basically 500 bucks pretty much yeah slightly less it's um <clears throat> 64 gig uh sorry 128 gig um it's got the new snapdragon processor in it like it's far and the, the dual cameras the multi-focal thing that it does you know everything you expect out of the, the Xiaomi stuff and it's yeah like 500 bucks so it's running the Snapdragon 845, which is a 10 nanometer chip. Um, actually, sorry, no. They've upgraded the 845 to the 855, which is a 7 nanometer chip. Uh, so 45% improvement processing power, 20% in graphics. Uh, it's wi the Wi-Fi wi charging is 27 watts. Um, and everyone else is maxing out at 20 watts. So they're, you know... You look at the specs on this thing. It's a uh, uh, the phone is uh, basically six point two inches by six, and it's still seven. It's only eight, the phone's only eight mil eight mil thick. Um, reducing the phone by forty percent thickness. They've changed the asset ratio to nineteen point five to nine. Uh, the only downside is they're taking a hundred milliamp off the battery to do this. But 
Um, it's ninety percent screen to ten percent body, so mm. they've still got a pretty good ratio there. Um, the only complaint is, of course, all that glass leads to fingerprints, but you'd expect that. The fingerprints again is twenty five percent faster than anyone else in the market. They use the Samsung AMOLED panel with twenty three forty by ten eighty resolution. Um, you know, so basically everything that they test uh, surpasses the previous model and surpasses most things on the market. Yeah, for instance, the five hundred dollar phone. So, um. <sighs> When you're competing with that, really, it, it's hard to it's hard to see um, value in you know a two and a half thousand dollar phone. Yeah, you know it's a two point eight gig processor. Um, but does it flip? Sixty gig RAM, six hundred twenty eight gig of non expandable storage. Um, you know, so I mean that that's the thing, but they've added two thousand dollars to the price just to make the phone fold in half. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um they recorded in uh four K resolution for nine hours and fifty seven minutes on the battery. Um that's a pretty hard hard test on it. So but yeah, it's got obviously the GPS, IR, Blaster, NFC, OTG, Bluetooth 5, Wi-Fi, dual SIM. And so, of course, it's a dual SIM as well. Both SIMs connect f- can connect to 4G, but they're both active SIMs, so it's not just dual SIM, they're dual active SIM. Uh, 20 meg selfie camera, 24 meg... Um, 24 meg rear... Oh, sorry, 48 meg rear... Um, Plus a it's a, so it's a forty eight meg rear camera plus a sixteen meg wide angle and a twelve meg telephoto, all hidden behind the same lens. Ah. So it's got three yeah. separate lenses. With a, it's actually using a half inch sensor, so it's actually quite a big sensor. So you're actually going to get really good, really good resolution out of that. Um, yeah. The twelve meg telephoto lens has a two by optical zoom. Uh, the 16 meg wide angle is 117 degree field of view. Wow, that's actually pretty impressive. So yeah, I mean the specs just keep. The more you read about it, the better the, the better the specs get. So, um, I don't know. A lot of one thing I was reading about these, um, a lot of movie. Well, it's the low budget movies like like um, independent movies and stuff like that a lot of them are using these for their 4k cameras now because they're basically expendable if they put one on mount, mount one to a car and it crashes and <laughs> destroys the camera it's not a big deal you know yeah. for 500 bucks they're, they're replaceable you know but they do it does um, 960 frames per second at 4k in if you wanted right. to do slow-mo you know, which is just it's just insane. Like that that that's a ridiculous frame rate for in four K, you know. So um so yeah, look make up your own mind on that one. <laughs> so Alrighty. Well that's probably about it. All right, thanks for listening to the Aussie Tech Head show broadcast weekly. We can be found at Facebook.com slash Aussie Tech Heads, Twitter.com slash Aussie Techs, and YouTube.com slash Aussie Tech Heads. Email is Glenn, Will, and Warlock at AussieTechHeads.com.au. You can hear Aussie Tech Heads on AussieTechRadio.com, 24 7 back to back play of some of the best tech related shows from around Australia and New Zealand. New shows are added each Friday. See you, everyone. Bye.